Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. I'm your host, James Evan Pilato. It is a Sunday morning, July 14th, and we are stoked to have Jeff Rugby, writer, music producer, and more specifically to our purposes right here today, creator of the new Gunning for Hits comic out on Image, the first six issues get collected in the arc that comes out late this week at San Diego Comic-Con. And I am stoked to talk to Jeff Rugby. Thanks so much for taking the time for us. My pleasure. So first things first, how was the blackout? Uh, we didn't get the blackout. Oh. So I'm, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. So uh, I, get, uh, I get witches and uh, warlocks, but I don't get uh, that many blackouts. I thought you were in Manhattan. Uh, nope, not for a while. You, and you feel good about that? <laughs> uh, well, you know, under under the circumstance, I'd rather not be in Manhattan on a hot night when there's no uh, there's no electricity. Well, man, and that's the thing. And I wouldn't have remembered this off the top of my head. But I am, you know, I'm a, I'm a news and, and history and, and anniversaries kind of junkie. That the blackout was right on the anniversary of the '77 blackout. Whoa! No kidding. On I think to the day. Wow, that's incredible. That's so, incredible. So there's all these weird, and I wonder if you just, and I kind of, was, I thought you were in New York, so that's why I was going to ask. It's just, it's a weird, so basically, so I, the classic trajectory, college radio, commercial radio, and now I do internet radio. And I deal in a, what I call, you know, news, music, memes, and more, and I deal with a lot of what you might call parapolitics, what someone else might call crazy conspiracies. But there, I mean... It's. I can almost hang it up right now because it, it, the world has now turned into that. It's just all these, like, I don't know if you've seen the stuff about Area 51 and there's storms hitting, you know, New Orleans and L.A. quakes and Epstein and just everything's kind of, it's almost like they say satire's dead because it's all just playing out right there. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, you know, why would you bother to come up with uh, conspiracy theories at this point because, you know, that's that's the world 24-7. It's yeah, it's almost like it's all kind of gone, kind of gone mainstream. But so it's yeah, it's kind of it's kind of an odd, odd kind of spot to be in. So speaking of kind of anniversaries and sinks and things, we also just a couple of days ago had and we I talked about it on my morning show. We had the 50th anniversary of the release of Space Oddity. And so, I mean, we're, we're about to have the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. And then right after that, of course, is the 50th anniversary of the Manson family murders. And that's all going to be memorialized in the new Tarantino movie. So we're in just a weird kind of media stew, I guess. Yeah, you know, well, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of anniversaries, they're sort of becoming more important, these longer anniversaries, especially because... You know, we're all I was thinking about this today because, you know, we're all living longer. Right. And, uh, you know, we've got a longer life cycle as consumers, too. So uh, a lot of anniversaries are marketing opportunities. And so they're shoved in our face more. You know, uh, I don't know that you consider the the Manson murders a mar marketing opportunity necessarily. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the Tarantino movie like I look forward to any anything he does. Um, and I know some people who are actually working on. Uh, books about uh, the Manson stuff that um, contain a lot of information that's never been out before. But, mm. um, uh, it, you know, yeah, you're right. It's uh, uh, it is weird that uh, that all these anniversaries are happening. And, and, you know, it's it's funny in terms of space. Oddity, I was just thinking it's it, it was almost 30 years ago to the day ish that David gave me the demo tape of Space Oddity Um which seemed like an ancient artifact at that point. Yet I realized it was only 20 years old then. And, and you know, now it's 30 years later. So <laughs> it's yeah. really, it's crazy. So you're, I mean, are you, you lifelong music nerd? Do you still collect? Do you have a, do you have a large catalog of stuff at, at your home? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I bought a couple of eight tracks yesterday from the uh, used store. <laughs> right on. What'd you get? Uh, I I got Queens the game and Mahavishnu Orchestra's Birds of Fire from '73, and they of course they sound awful. They sound friggin' terrible. The, yes. The extra funny part, of course, was and these are the things again that as 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 the time goes by, we mark these points. The girl ringing it up, she of course is like, "What is this? This this is a VHS tape? Is this a cassette tape?" <laughs> well, you know. In her defense, there's you know probably more than half the people alive on Earth 
were not born when Atrax died, so. For sure. We, but yeah, my wife and I then joked, it was like, oh, we could have shot one of those internet videos where they show kids funny arcane technology and try and get them to figure it out. Yeah, but yeah, she, I, I had to tell her, it was like, it's called an 8-track, and it was pretty much the worst music format that we ever had, which is why you don't really need to know about them, probably. <laughs> well, not to go off on a tangent, but, uh, you know, for years I've been collecting music and some of the rarest releases are eight tracks that were put out only through the Columbia Record Club towards the end of, you know, well, actually, I shouldn't say the end of the, towards the end of the 80s, I guess. There was like a Beatles love songs or something compilation and the Bruce Springsteen uh, live box. Um, from you know the mid '80s, mm. only came out on a track through through Columbia Music Club, and so there weren't many of them made, and they're worth a fortune. <laughs> well, you're in the media monarchy, so that doesn't really take us too far off the field. We've, I, I was a giant fan <laughs> of Columbia House as a kid. I know I have, and, and, as I've started to add my my collection to Discogs. I don't know if you're that much of a nerd that you use Discogs. I don't. I don't catalog my stuff through Discogs. No. So I'm going through there, kind of cataloging stuff. And again, I'm not I'm not in it for money. But of course, you look and go, oh, and you know, you're surprised. Some things you think might be worth more aren't. And, and so I have what I definitely recall when Columbia House was doing there. That is it. We are through selling vinyl. We're having a blowout. Everything was super cheap. I have George Michael's Listen Without Prejudice on, on vinyl that I know is from Columbia House. And it's like, oh, that's now actually more rare because it is the club. And in other situations, it's worse because it's on the club. Right. Like any CD that's from the club, for the most part, is worthless. Although I will say, with the Bowie stuff, they asked us to do a box set of, uh, an exclusive box set of the gold remasters that we did. So they were kind of like mobile fidelity remasters uh, on the pressed on gold disc. And uh, that box set is worth a small fortune at this point. Well, and that actually, that'll, that'll bring us, that'll, that'll bring us back around. So as a kid in the music clubs, I, I used it a lot as a way to, to try things out. Cause again, I'm basically on my, my, my paper route and lawn mowing kind of money. And so best ofs and things like that were a nice way to go. Oh, I, I'm supposed to maybe explore this artist or check this thing out. I had gawked at the sound and vision box set in the record store and came a lot music. That was my, that was my store I went to growing up. But I couldn't afford that, of course, but I did get the Changes Bowie cassette kind of compilation sampler through, I either got it through Columbia House, I, I was in the BMG Club as well. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a big uh, record club hit, that, uh, that particular compilation. And that really, and that was my main, I mean, you know, I knew who Bowie was just sort of as, you know, as a media, th you know, as someone, a singer, but I didn't. Having that, and it had still had it had all the personnel listing, so then I could go through it and be like, Stevie Ray Vaughan plays on this? Wow, that's Clarence Clemens playing, you know, and it just made all these other sort of connections that as a, as a kid I loved. Well, you know, I'm usually not a fan of artists who do a lot of compilations, and, and you know, there have been some crappy Bowie ones, um, none of the ones I was involved with, of course, um, but, um, uh, but I do think that, that for, especially for him, um, you do sort of need a gateway, because, you know, he's changing styles so much in the 70s, especially, that um, you can jump in on one record, and then... Uh, go, oh, I really like that. I'm going to buy another one. And you get a completely different kind of record. So if there's something that makes coherent sense of um, a, a career arc and, and the changes that he went through, um, then that's really helpful. And, you know, my first record that I bought with my own money was um, Changes One Bowie, the, you know, the original mm -hmm. vinyl version uh, of the, the compilation that you know, we later expanded into changes Bowie. So, um, so, you know, I appreciate that in, uh, in, especially in a Bowie context, um, on a very high level. My last Walkman, I know that I, and I'm sure, and I think it's still, cause the Sony Walkmans really were the best. I think my last Walkman didn't die. I just, of course, stopped using it. And I think it just has one little picture of David Bowie's head kind of taped on there. And it's sort of still, you know, it's sort of, it's like a, a time capsule, as it were. Wow. 
So wow. before we got going here, I was listening to the playlist. So the, in the comic, which we're going to talk about here in a second, the comic, of course, has its own playlist that you've updated with with all kinds of music from 60s, 70s, all the way up to, to really current. One of the last things I heard there on the playlist was, of course, the Smiths paint a vulgar picture about how the music industry loves to put out best ofs, most ofs, satiate the need. But I'll maybe ask you more about Morrissey later. So... <laughs> Because there's, because there's, de- you know, there's, there's definite Morrissey Bowie connections and stories and in history, but you, more to the matter at hand, you're getting prepped to go off to the big, massive San Diego Comic Con this week to promote your new Gunning for Hits comic. So just maybe if you want to give folks just kind of the thumbnail about about what's coming up at San Diego and the book itself. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so we've uh, we just finished the first arc, uh, which came out last month, uh, uh, the last issue of the six issue uh, first run. And uh, the the uh, trade paperback collection is coming out on Wednesday, the 17th of July, uh, which is the first uh, night of Comic-Con preview night. Um, and uh, at Comic-Con, we're going to have uh, a hardcover uh, edition with a different cover um, that's uh, signed and numbered by me. Uh, and uh, depending on if Mortak gets uh, down to San Diego and Casey Silver get down to San Diego uh, from Seattle, they'll be there too. But we'll uh, I'm going to be signing at the Image booth on uh, Friday. Uh, sorry, Thursday. Wait a minute. I've got you as Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, I think it's Thursday. Yeah, you're right. Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. Absolutely. 100% correct. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been so busy the last few days that uh, I, I'm, I'm almost oblivious as to what day today is. But yes, you're right. Uh, so um, so people can uh, come by and get their book signed. And uh, I'll be doing sketches if Mortad isn't there to uh, do them for you. And, uh, and then I'm also bringing down uh, a couple of very limited... Uh, uh, prints of uh, the covers um, of issues six and two. Ah. two. Two is the station to station yep. uh, sort of uh, uh, homage. And then the uh, issue six was the Butcher Billy cover. Um, and he's a real uh, well known Brazilian mashup artist who does uh, a pop artist, really, who's done a lot of Bowie related stuff. Um, and uh, it was really great to get him to uh, do a cover for us. Well, man, those are the two that, that, that I was going to say. I was like, well, issue two is the, yeah, the station to station kind of style. And just the issue six just looks so, it looks so retro cool. Yeah, I really dig that cover. I mean, that, that's, uh, his style's amazing and the colors really pop. And, and actually, the hardcover is going to have that image on the front, um, which is a different image than is on the trade. So. Yeah, I yeah, I it, just looking at it, you know, and again, it, it hits music nerds like me that are also comics fans. So if I can, I'll, I'll do the blurb and, and lay it out for folks real quick. Gunning for Hits is the story of Martin Mills, a record company talent scout in the shady 80s New York City music biz. Following an unbroken string of hits, Martin jumps at the chance to make a comeback album with his favorite classic rock legend, But when things go wrong, Martin's forced to use deadly skills from his mysterious past in a desperate bid to save his rep and the artist's career. So it's the music industry and organized crime together at last? (laughs) Well, you know, it's not really organized crime. Um, I haven't gotten into Martin's uh, whole history in the comic yet. Um, But in each arc that we do, we'll reveal a little more about where he's coming from. Um, But it's not an organized crime background. Um unless you consider the government organized crime. So, Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) so, uh, so that's a little, a little bit of a hint, but, um, uh, there's, there's quite a complex background to how Martin became the person he is and, um, and then how he got into the music business and will eventually tell all of those stories. Uh, I hope, uh, I'm, I'm teeing up the second arc now and, um, and I have his whole life plotted out in, uh, about 15, uh, uh three ring binders, um, with calendar printouts for, uh, every year. That's, uh, you know, an important part of his, uh, chronology. And, uh, that's what feeds the Twitter feed that, um, 
uh, has excerpts from his diary, which is sort of a supplemental way to enjoy the series because it is 2019, and why would the book alone be enough? So, <laughs> so there's the Twitter account, the Spotify playlist, of course, the yeah, the different editions as well. And what I love actually is that I mean, we kick off in this first arc. In 1987, which I often only slightly jokingly say on my show is the year pop achieved perfection. For me, I was 10 years old in 1987, and that's NXS and Bobby Brown and Paul Abdul and Guns N' Roses and just all that, George Michael, all that stuff just kind of popping at once. And now as the decades have gone by, it's like, ah, that's as far as my pop years go. That's really just, you know, my, my favorite time. So the fact that the place, you know, that your story opens in the spring of 1987, I love. Well, it's interesting that you touch on that because, um, you know, th th it is an, an important year. And I think it's kind of yet to be recognized as that. I think like recently someone just sort of or, you know, collectively we sort of landed on 1977 being, you know, a pivotal year. Uh, of in the 70s right and um, and I feel like 87 is sort of the same year or the same sort of importance because you know it's 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 the year of the first Nirvana show it's the it's the release of Appetite for Destruction which you know those two events you could argue that it's the it's the really the last surge of rock as an art form mm. um, but you know you've also got you know, hip hop is changing, like uh, it, it's shifting from being uh, New York and East Coast based to being West Coast based and gangster raps coming up. And you've got all the pop music stuff happening. And then you've got, jeez, um, uh, uh, you know, the hair metal bands are kind of peaking and uh, about to be swept away by grunge, but they don't know it yet. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different um, really important uh, cultural movements within uh, pop music in, in, in that year. And that was, yeah, I think when I was really kind of coming of age and really starting to pay attention and really starting to kind of dive into it all. I again on your on your playlist, not only the Smith song, which is from 1987 about about the record labels, but I was just listening to to Richard Marks' "Don't Mean Nothing," which has always been a fantastic song. Also from 1987, essentially, if not maybe just talking about only the music biz, but maybe the entertainment business at large. I had maybe never caught his California snow joke in that song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, people don't give I mean, I think now, actually, he's he's getting credit uh, for the first time uh, on Twitter as being like a really clever, you know, humorous guy, which I think people sort of lost in the, you know, his, his I mean, his first record was multi-platinum, probably the biggest record of his career. Um, so, you know, he started on this, you know, huge uh, uh peak and i don't think people had time to assess what his personality was and and you didn't get a lot of his personality from mtv back then and all that stuff and i think now people are starting to understand that that he was actually a, a, a pretty cool guy uh even though he was considered somewhat uncool at the time and those songs uh, you know hold up pretty well um uh, compared to a lot of other songs that may have been bigger that year so um so good for him um and, you know, before I forget, because this was another thing I wanted to say about 87, one of the reasons, the other reasons I said it in 1987 is because that's when the year when I really think the CD tipping point happened, um, you know, sort of building up to that year. But in 1987, the Beatles CDs came out, for instance, um, for the first time. And uh, what you had was catalog that had maybe been uh, of no value to record companies suddenly becoming valuable again. So they were experiencing this huge boom, right? Because MTV was kind of the national radio station and was driving sales in an incredible way. And then all of these old records that the labels hadn't even kept in print were suddenly valuable again. And you could sell them on this new format with a higher markup than uh, making a, vi a vinyl record or a cassette. Um, so the corporations start looking at record companies at that point and buying them up because it's boom time, right? And uh, in the course of all of that happening, 
they're firing these guys who've run these labels for years who are real music guys and they're putting in you know guys from frozen food companies and procter and gamble and stuff uh to run the companies and and uh, the the industry is shifting in a huge way have you ever read uh frederick dannon's hitman book oh yeah that's okay. I've got I have it on the stack on the desk next to the stack of gunning for hits issues. Power brokers and fast money inside the music biz. So all that I, that 87 stuff to me was then that lead up because and I have I have one older sibling that thankfully it was that skateboarding BMX punk rock culture in the mid 80s that slowly made its way of course even to where I was in small town West Virginia. And it wouldn't be very long before then I'm hearing the dead Kennedys and misfits and getting way, you know, crazier ideas. So there was a little bit of that lead up before the grunge explosion. I think I was seeing the the bits of it kind of coming out already. Sure. Well, you know, that's what, uh, that's what uh, older uh, relatives and siblings are great for is turning you on to new music. Yep. Absolutely. So, so in the comic again, if you're a fan of Chuck Klosterman, it's just you just you you hit all my buttons of everything I want in in media I love to consume. So it, it had music nerds like me going to search because you reference right in the first issue about 120 minutes, the, the alternative show on on MTV. I was like, was, uh, was 120 minutes on in 1987, and I have to go look it up, and and indeed it was. So you've 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 gotten the correct dates and things to, as well. <laughs> well, it did change uh, host many times, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, in fact, I think when they first started it, um, it was a revolving cast of uh, the regular VJs, and then they decided to give it its own identity, and they started hiring a specific host just to do that show. I feel like I, I came in on the, the Dave Kendall era. It's really mine, probably. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's very <laughs> guy with the British accent. What's more alternative than that? <laughs> who, who, of course, looks a bunch like Morrissey, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So are there in, in speaking of the consolidation, because then we know, of course, what would come next would be the grunge explosion. And every half functioning band in the world got signed to a label deal that they were probably never going to be able to make profitable. So are there even A&R guys still left in the traditional sense? At, at, at this time? At this time in 2019. You know, n no. I mean, you, you know, I think there there are, yes, probably still some people who have that title. But um, in terms of what they do compared to what was being done, you know, in the 80s and 90s and even in the early part of this century, um, you know, it's a, it's a completely different thing. And, you know, I know at some very big labels at some point, they had kids who were just scanning YouTube looking for <laughs> bands that had gotten lots of plays um, and signing them based on that. And they had essentially gotten rid of their uh, their traditional A&R staff um, and, and just hired a, you know, a bunch of kids who were basically interns. So. Um, so, yeah, it's it's shifted quite a bit. Mm. Well, and, you know, it, it's harder than ever to be to make money in the music business and really in all the arts mm -hmm. um, because of the democratization of the Internet. Um, and, you know, I can see both sides to it. There's the uh, there's uh, there's some value in gatekeepers to a certain extent. And then there's some things that um, probably never would have happened if it wasn't for the open market. So, you know. It's a, uh, it's just, it's, I, I'm conflicted about it. I, I think at least for me as on, on, on the fan side still, and again, that's, I mean, that's why I, I love doing radio and, and rock and roll and media. So, cause that's what I love. So back at my commercial radio job, I was able, as you might not be surprised to learn, they were going through constant shifts and changes and firing people and sort of trying to tweak the format or trying to figure, I basically worked for one of the there's not a lot of them left that i don't think what's called triple a adult sure. album alternative yep and they were just you know trying to find their place as as everything had, had really changed um i was able to sort of i don't want to say get away with but i was able to sort of do more of what i wanted so of course you get five emails 
that say, hey, do you want to talk to the person from the, the, the contestants, the finalists on The Biggest Loser or this reality? It's like, no, no, no. And then you get the one that's like, do you want to talk to John Lydon about his new book? And you go, fuck, yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I was able to kind of pick and choose and and also with even some of the artists that would come into the studio that were that were touring through town. I don't know how many interviews I would, you know, wrap up and we'd be finished. And they'd be like, man, thanks. That was that was really fun. Usually radio in the morning sucks a bunch. But it, I was able to tell them it's like you're here because I'm a fan of you. That's why I wanted to do the interview. So I wasn't able to you know, or didn't have to rather, you know, talk to too many folks that I wasn't interested in. That's great. And that's, you know, that's really what artists who, you know, are out on that grind of doing, you mm -hmm. know, touring and doing, uh, you know, morning shows. Um, they don't like to get up early. And a lot of times they, you know, they go to the station or they sit on the phone for 20 minutes waiting for the morning guy to get to them. And then it's like a 30 second, you know, interview. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, that's why they hate it. So when there's somebody like you who's got real enthusiasm, they can recognize that and it it uh, it makes it all worthwhile so good for you well and i should say it was probably more the comedians that were the ones physically coming into the studio on friday morning because they were going to do a you know thursday friday saturday run at the comedy club in town those were the ones that would yes yeah, that would physically drag ass in there but <laughs> <laughs> well they all appreciate it if you know if you if you know their stuff and you actually you know care about them then uh, that makes a big difference so will the other arcs of Gunning for Hits, will they keep moving forward chronologically or will we have some that maybe jump back in time or? Um, I think we're going to, yeah, we're going to start doing some stuff where there will be like flashbacks okay. and, uh, and uh, you know, at some point there'll be a series that starts with, uh, you know, a documentary uh, about Martin um, who, will by that point be dead and uh and we'll uh, we'll we'll learn a lot more about him than, than we've even learned through the whole series so and this is your first comic right yeah yeah it's um it's really my you know aside from a, a bunch of liner notes that i've written it's really the first thing i've had published uh you know professionally so to speak so I bet when I put this all together and have the links in the show notes, I'm sure I'll hear from someone and they're like, dude, he worked on this other thing. Why didn't you ask him about that? <laughs> <laughs> but so you I mean, you, you got to work with you got to work with the one and only David Bowie. And I still think of I mean, speaking of just sort of media and synchronicities and just essentially kind of the the, the magic of media, if you will. Bowie's. His dis it was just his his death, his disappearance, as it were, it was just the most amazing kind of media magic trick I, I recall seeing that he essentially drops the record and then takes off. It was just it was, it was stunning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, like, you know, do, was it staged? Whatever. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, could he have been gone days before? Uh, Black Star was released, maybe, mm. but you know who cares? <laughs> really, I mean the 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 uh, the the way he did that and how he uh, engineered it is just brilliant. And uh, it was so weird because I remember getting the record on Friday, which I still don't understand why records come out on Friday <laughs> instead of Tuesday still. But um, oh yeah, or, I, or I, Monday. I like Friday as universal release day. Well, you know, here's here's what I don't understand though, because this is the I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but the music this is the music industry working against itself, right? Is they're going, we're going to put stuff out on Friday. Well, you know, Tuesday is the day that DVDs and Blu-rays come out. So if you're gonna have, you get a shrinking base of retail that's going to support, you know, physical media, and you're trying to stake a day that's not the same day that everything else comes out which you know five years ago everything came out on tuesday so you'd be able to buy the new movie that came out and the and the new cd that came out or you 
you know, the vinyl or whatever, all on the same day. And now it's like two trips to the store, which you would think just in in some executives head, you go, why do we want to make people go to the store twice in one week if they're media fans? You know, why do we want to force that on them or make them wait a few days? Because, you know, part of being excited about something coming out is like going to get it the day it comes out and having it in your hand and you may get caught up in that excitement and buy something else you didn't plan on buying. And uh, it always seemed weird to me that they made that break. But anyway, so well, sorry. But that doesn't even get into And then Wednesday is new comic book day. Right. Sure. Which, you know, <laughs> so that's three days now. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I can't rem- I remember a time when comic, new comic book day was a different day, but I don't remember if it was Friday, maybe. I can't I can't remember, but I you know I remember it shifting to Wednesday and thinking, hmm, okay. <laughs> well, and you and you do make a good point. I mean, Friday, as far as the as as the news world goes, is referred to as dumping day. It's like that's when you put things out that you don't want people to pay attention to because they're off on their weekends. Sure, right, yeah, and it's just it's all it's quite bizarre. I always heard it explained that it was almost the sort of the physical thing of of having to ship those records out and that they put it on kind of an odd day because they wanted to make sure everybody had the chance and that the same day a kid in Dubuque could go get the record the same as a kid in Manhattan. Yeah. So when I was growing up, they, there really weren't release dates. Like, you know, you just had to call around and find out if the record was out yet. Hmm. You knew, you might know it was coming from press and radio and TV and all that stuff, but it, there was not a specific release date. And then when they decided Monday is going to be release date, that was pretty good, except as the business got bigger, uh, people started, you know, retailers started getting their shipments earlier because let's say Music Land, which was a national chain or, you know, semi-national chain, would have to get the records really early, break them down and then ship them from their warehouse to individual stores. So they deserve to get them early. But then there were like these little mom and pop stores or these small chains and they were like, why aren't we getting our records early? But what happened was, they, they acquiesced to the mom and pops, which is, you know, fine, except then as soon as it was after hours on Friday night when they knew all the record store uh, record labels were closed, they'd start selling the records, uh, breaking street day. Mm-hmm. So that's why it moved from Monday to Tuesday, because that way, you know, you could you could make sure that the mom and pops got their records in time uh, to sell them on Tuesday, but they didn't have time to break the street day. Nice. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's sad the uh, amount of garbage that's stored in my head. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is <laughs> it's not garbage. The, again, these are the, these are all the parts and pieces. You know, it's 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 it strikes me a lot of times, you know, when I, again, when you look at videos of showing kids VCRs or all the things online and all the remixes, it's like, man, we're going to spend the first 100 years of the internet remixing and breaking down and somewhat destroying and throwing out the previous 100 years of media. It's all kind of, kind of getting reconfigured. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a totally good point. So I'm sorry, you had asked a question and I, I, I diverged. Do you remember what the question was? It was, it was a Bowie related question and I can't remember what it was. Oh, I was maybe just kind of referring to the, to, you know, his kind of his magic trick of, of leaving. Hmm. So there maybe wasn't actually a, a question there exactly, but I can uh, turn it into a question of what do you what do you think about Morrissey? So there was essentially as I was right around getting into Bowie was pretty much when I got into Morrissey, and then suddenly it was like Bowie's covering covering Morrissey on his album, and it's kind of you know blew my mind. Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, I remember when uh, Last of the Famous International Playboys came out mm-hmm. and. You know, there was a big cover in Enemy where he been a big Morrissey story. And he basically said, you know, it's about, you know, the, the type of person that there's only a few of now. And it's me and Bowie. And then there was sort of the Bowie Morrissey, you know, uh, you know, love affair that then ended badly. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what a problematic figure Morrissey is now. Holy Moses. I mean, uh you know, I was a, a big fan uh, of the early Smiths records. Then I kind of lost them for a bit and came back when his solo career started and, and really 
uh, loved. Uh, oh man, what was the the one that Mick Ronson produced? Uh, Your Arsenal. Your Arsenal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I still think is his best record. Um, uh, and I think there are moments on other records that come close uh, to the best songs on that record. But as, as, as one piece, I think that's, that's the best record he made. And I, yeah. I put that down to Ronson because Ronson was a genius at arranging stuff. Um, Cause and, he was, uh, he was already sort of, he was dipping into a rockabilly feel, but yeah, Ronson on that album, just, it all comes together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, his band at that point was guys from, uh, was it the Rock Cats or something? I can't even remember. And yeah. and guys who had played with Adam Ant and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, it's funny because um, there was a band called Gallon Drunk who were getting big in England and they got signed to Sire in the States. But they had two records out in the UK that hadn't been released in the, in the States yet. And Sire was like, now we're going to hold off for the next record. But Morrissey gave him the open, opening slot on his first U.S. tour. And uh, the guys from Sire called me up and said, will you put these records out? Because we need them out fast because the, the, uh, the Morrissey tour is starting soon. And the first date was in Minneapolis, which is where I lived at the time. And I was like, sure, we'll put them out. We didn't pay them much of an advance and they didn't sell very much. And Gallon Drunk never became a very big band, at least over here. But um, part of the reason I did it was because I knew I could get backstage at the uh, at the show at the Morrissey show, uh, and I uh, was hoping that I would uh, get a chance to uh, glimpse him um, not on stage, and uh, of course I did not. Oh. But, <laughs> that of but everyone's going to be my next question. Then <laughs> I was like, "Did you meet him?" No, no. But I'll tell you that show was amazing because you know it was his first solo show in the United States, so. Morrissey fans had thrown flown in from all over the world and it was in a, you know, 2000 or 2,500 seat theater. So the streets were just packed with Morrissey fans, you know, looking for tickets who come from all over the place. So, uh, it was, a, and, and it was an amazing show. And of course, like a lot of the shows around that time, uh, it had to end early because the stage was invaded and he was dragged to the floor. But, um, but I think we got most of it anyway. The, yeah, those early shows were quite literally riotous. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I actually, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty ride or die on on Morrissey at this point. I think it's in some ways it's it's funny to be like, ah, he's been trolling media for thirty years. This is just his the next go round where people go, ah, I hate that guy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I kind of. He, he, after he got over the first, you know, whatever his comments were at Mad Stock, you know back in the 80s or the early 90s because that, that's the thing that essentially he won the libel case against enemy right yeah i think so yeah right because they just called him a racist yeah. or something on the cover yeah yeah um and you know uh, who you know at that point you sort of give him the benefit of the doubt and you know i'm not saying that he's not trolling but on the other hand like if he's really if that's the, if the, if he has to do that kind of trolling at this point, then I think that's sort of, I don't know, it's beneath him, you know. Mm, that's it, it, you, you know, I mean, I, 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 and 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 look, a lot of guys like him who came up in an era where you could sell a lot of records and make a lot of money are, uh, you know, are kind, are, are you know, understandably bitter that the world has changed and they can't go and get and this was morrissey's ma for a uh, or mo for a while was switching from label to label getting a giant advance every time and um and then of course not recouping it because the the number of physical sales were you know going down and the value of having morrissey on your label uh as the perceived value uh was higher than the actual value and eventually those sort of deals dried up for him so mm -hmm. um you know that's why he doesn't make a lot of records anymore a lot of guys don't make records anymore because they remember a time when they'd make a record and then big checks would start coming in and now that doesn't happen well and even at the peak of of the your arsenal album there was i mean there they ran a, they did an mtv news story about the Times square just massive he did a signing at the virgin megastore at the time there mm -hmm. um Th thanks for talking about Morrissey so much with me. One of my pets. So, yeah, hey, no 
I think I think the story goes because the end of I know it's going to happen someday, which is on the B side of of your arsenal, goes into a pretty much spot on imitation of the rock and roll suicide riff. And I think they did it as a, like a, you know a wink and a nod. They got Bowie's producer. Let's put in some riffs. I think Bowie then heard that and was like, oh, well, I'll do a cover of it on, on my new record as, as the sort of hat tip back is, is the way I kind of heard the story told. Yeah, that, you know, that sort of tracks, I, I you know, I mean, I certainly Bowie was aware of Morrissey, uh, you know, before before that point. And, uh, and I think that, like I said, I think they had a little bit of a mutual admiration society. And eventually I know they did a song together on stage in LA, I think mm-hmm. T-Rex cover maybe, um, in the very early nineties, but, uh, but then they had a falling out and I, I, I've, ne- I've never really kept track of that. Well, and that's, an, that's unfortunately become the, the, the thing that a lot of folks say. It's like, Hey, Morrissey announced a tour. Yeah. He canceled it now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> buying tickets for a Morrissey tour is, uh, it's like, uh, it's like buying lottery tickets. I, I definitely have to have not gone for some and it's like, there's no way that show's going to, you know, I always buy my tickets towards the beginning or end of the tour dates. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that actually, if, if, if you don't mind asking just a couple of other kind of music industry things at large and before I before I let you go, um, I th- you know, talking about Morrissey and labels and all that stuff that um, have you looked or heard anything about the, the Taylor Swift back catalog story this past week? Yeah, I mean, I've only heard very top line stuff. Um, you know, my take and I think I posted this on social media, so I will stick by it um is that um i think it's hard for artists to understand that when they sign a contract they're making a deal that um you know unless you initially sign a deal where your masters are going to revert you are not going to get your masters back um and my understanding is that she had an opportunity to do that and they actually told her like and and, and i think her dad or somebody was like on the board of big machine or was supposed to go to a meeting and represent her or something and didn't um and so the deal happened and then she's out there complaining about it which you know I understand you, you you want to get your master's back. I think they had made her an offer that she didn't like initially. Um, I'm kind of surprised that she wasn't able to get Universal to come on board with her and jointly buy back the masters. Um, I think Scooter Braun's kind of a douchebag and he'll eventually lose control of the masters and she'll get them back anyway. Um, it's a lot of what drove Bowie um, from the eighties on to, uh, make as much money as he could because he wanted to buy his masters back from, uh, or the share of masters that, uh, Tony DeFries owned, um, mm. back. Um, and I think Taylor Swift is smart enough and, uh, and driven enough to do that. And she probably will. Um, and Scooter Braun's probably, um, you know, uh, uh, reckless enough that he might lose them anyway. Um, <laughs> But uh, but I, I I understand her bitterness, but I also think like you know you signed a deal, a, a label's gonna invest a bunch of time, energy, money into uh, making you uh, a star, and then uh, you both win. So to come back later and go, well now I'm a big star and I want my masters back, it's like well that was sort of the trade off you made, and and most labels invest a lot of money in a lot of different artists and they don't uh they don't most artists aren't profitable uh and never were the the majority of artists never were profitable so so you need those giant records to be important assets in your catalog and to help you generate income so that you can keep doing it so i i can see both sides of it i can you know, and, and I, 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 I wish she hadn't framed it the way she did, because if she had said this is a cautionary tale, that's a, a worthwhile thing to say uh, and and uh, and to inform 
uh, new artists about what they're getting into if they sign a deal where they don't own their masters. Um, but to come out and say, oh, this is the worst thing that could have ever happened. And, you know, these guys screwed me over. I don't know that that's necessarily the actual story. So it, it doesn't sound like it is. And she hasn't denied their subsequent statement about, you know, what what actually went down. So um, so I, I, I tend to believe uh, that there's at least an element of truth in what they said. Huh. Yeah, I guess I was just I, I, I'm sort of surprised at someone who I perceive, I think, pretty correctly to be just one of the most powerful and calculating pop stars out there that I would be. I, I guess I'm just surprised it got to this point for her in the first place. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, certainly there was a point where after her initial contract, like you usually signed for a certain number of records and you or you have options. The label has options to to say, OK, the first record went well. We believe in you. We're going to do another record. And this is the advance. And you build that all into the initial contract. And then when you get to the end of the options, you renegotiate. And certainly she's been through the renegotiation process at least once at, up to this point. It, and this is, well, I shouldn't say certainly, but based on my understanding. So it is. it does seem weird that she didn't address that issue then and that she would have continued with that company if she could have gotten mm -hmm. a better deal elsewhere where the masters would have reverted. So I don't know if she either didn't think that... Um, it wasn't going to mean that much to her retaining her masters or that she thought that she would get them back uh, regardless. But um, the normal point where you would build in the master reversion process is when you're renegotiating your deal. Um, and, uh, and it does seem weird to me that she didn't uh, or, or wasn't able to and re-signed with the same label because obviously, uh, you know, the whole world was interested in signing her and was throwing all sorts of money at her. So who knows? Hey, so sp speaking of mastering, and this is one that I'd be crazy if I didn't mention, you mastered all the posthumous Bill Hicks releases? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we did. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say we mastered them, but uh, we, uh, we put out, um, there had been two albums released while he was alive. And then he was working on two more, when he died and his uh, friend and uh, producer uh, Kevin Booth mm -hmm. uh, finished uh, the work on those and um, and uh, and then we released them but I was a huge Bill Hicks fan and had, had never been able to see him because I was traveling so much at that point whenever he was in Minneapolis I was out of town so uh, I missed him and um, and I never got to see him live um, but um, he's one of the artists that uh, I'm proudest of working with, even in an estate situation. Uh, I love his family very much, and I think about um, Bill's words every day um, because I I don't know that there's been there's I don't think there's been a better stand-up comedian since Bill. Mm. Um, I don't think there's been anyone whose voice I miss as much as Bill's uh, because we can always use somebody who tells the truth and makes us laugh. And even more than I miss Bowie, I think I miss Bill. Mm. Yeah, I was, a, I was a giant fan myself. I think I was lucky enough in a way, again, being a media kid. If you recall, before it was Comedy Central, it was just called The Comedy Channel, and they didn't have any original programming, and they just played stand-up clips and movie clips as though they were almost like MTV videos, even with the little credits in the corner at the beginning and end. I wow. saw all those Bill Hicks things kind of back then, when, it, when, he, when he was still around. So I was able, fortunately, yeah, to be introduced to him yeah, while he was still alive. You even slip in the phrase fevered ego into issue one of Gun and Crits. <laughs> Super bonus points for that. <laughs> well, let me tell you, there's plenty of there's actually plenty of Bill Hicks, Hicks references in there. Um, so, Excellent. Um, yeah, and there will continue to be because I love Bill very much. Well, and you, you mentioned, you said Universal when we were talking about Taylor Swift. That was the other sort of just general music industry news thing I was going to ask you about, the, the Universal Music Fire. 
Yeah, so um, it's interesting because I was at EMI uh, when that happened, and EMI had either been sold or was just about to be sold to Universal. Um, and it's a complicated story, but uh, in the process, EMI was basically split up between Warner Brothers and Universal because uh, it would have been a monopoly otherwise. So there was this whole process that's still going on uh, where they're having to sell off assets and whatever. But I guess the point is we heard that we heard about the universal fire and we were, uh, very relieved that the, uh, EMI assets hadn't been moved to the universal storage facility yet because, you know, that would have been the beach boys multi-tracks and, uh, you know, mm. could potentially, potentially Beatles masters and, uh, and a lot of other things. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of outrage about it, um, be, because there was stuff that was uh, still to be released. That's, and, you know. that's the, I, I, honestly, when I was going through the story on, on my show, that's the most heartbreaking part to me is the things that we've, we had never heard from sort of lesser known or maybe even unknown artists. Right. And that is, that's, a, that's a tragedy. Um, uh, and, and, you know, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there's, especially with jazz, you know, there's, there was a lot of culture and stuff that, you know, maybe at the end of the day, really only, you know, a hardcore completist or, you know, a real scholar would want, but still it's now gone. Um, and that is, that is super tragic. Um, but of the stuff that's been released, you know, uh, the older stuff is on, you know, oxidized tape which is just due to time is decaying mm -hmm. so uh, hopefully the digital uh masters well you know not always your preferable source um may still exist and will be high res enough that there's really not much more you could have gotten out of those tapes especially considering that you know as time passes they become less and less viable uh day after day Hey, so before we wrap up then here, let me ask you, I always like, love to ask folks, what what new music are you are you digging? New bands, new songs, if if any? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I like. Um, you know, I'm a, I, I was a huge fan of this band, Czar, um, that mm -hmm. came out of L.A. Um, it, around the turn of the century. And uh, their lead singer released a solo record on my label um, last year. Um, and, uh, that's one of my favorite records, but, um, man, what else am I listening to lately? I've been listening to a lot of, uh, lemon twigs and, uh, uh, oh, those dudes are crazy. Yeah. I love that sound. <laughs> Foxy Jen, um, Dorothy, uh, geez, uh, Man, I. That's all right. <laughs> you, you don't have to. No, I'm having, like it's it's really bugging me because like there's a couple of records that came out in the last year that I have fallen in love with, and now I'm having a total brain freeze. Um, uh, it's Mary Timoney's band. Oh. Uh, um, um, she put out a new record at the beginning of this year. Yeah, uh, it's not gonna come. Uh, X Hex. Yes. Whew. Fantastic. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. That's, well, that's again. I I was a kid of the you know born in seventy seven, which again as as the years have gone by, I've been able to go. Oh man, like I was born right when they were catching like Son of Sam and Elvis was dying and Elvis Costello was releasing his debut record. Like I love now that that's when I kind of sprang forth as it were. But uh, I I mean I spent my time in record stores and and VHS you know movie rental stores. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I mean, it, it's the sad part as much as the Internet is like this place where we can all share stuff um, there. It doesn't it having lived through both. It doesn't compare to going into a record store or, a you know, or a, a, a video rental place or whatever. And um, and actually talking to people and like getting to know uh, the guy at the counter who. The, the, works a couple days a week and has your same taste and will recommend records to you yep. or movies. And, you know, you go on the internet and it's like, everyone's like relatively anonymous and somebody says they like something and then it's a pylon, you know, and 
really had someone who was that big of an asshole in a record store. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I think I slowly won over the, the clerks at the Camelot Music with what I would buy, because then each time they'd go, oh, you're buying this. Like, and then that's how we kind of sparked up, sparked up friendships. Yeah, you know, and that, that was a big part of it, especially in places where, you know, you where you weren't near a big city. Yep. Um, you know, cool people worked in record stores. And if somebody came in and bought a cool record, they were like, oh, you're buying a cool record. You know, the, 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 the 50th guy who came in and bought Brian Adams, they don't think about it twice, you know, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I like Brian Adams. But, you know, it, it's not that unusual to sell a Brian Adams record. Somebody comes in and buys a you know a, a weird new wave record that you know you really like and you've never sold before. You're like, oh, how did, how are you how'd you get into this? And you know, I have friends that I met that way that I'm still friends with. So, yeah, I mean, for you know, being a kid in in West Virginia in the '80s, I mean, 120 minutes, Camelot music, came, uh, Columbia House. As lame as those things might sound now, they were a freaking lifeline. <laughs> You know, it's one of the reasons that uh, Kurt Cobain let uh, let them censor in utero uh, because he wanted kids to be able to buy it at Kmart because that's where he bought his records. Yep. So, you man, know, I mean, I, I man, I, I appreciate you spending so much time. I, you've got a record label, <laughs> you've got a comic about the music biz, and of course the Twitter accounts and the Spotify playlist. I, you know, you got you got all the stuff that I love. Well, thanks. And I, you know, I hope that uh, you, you uh, uh, your listeners, uh, if they uh, if they love all this stuff, that they'll uh, check out the book because uh, it's a collision of all those things. And uh, and uh, that's who I am and uh, and why I made it for for people like us who who love that stuff. So. So, man, I'm I'm super stoked to read more. I hope if any of the folks are able within the sound of my voice to go check out Jeff Rugby this weekend at the big, massive San Diego Comic-Con. He's there Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. I'll, clu- I'll include all that stuff in the show notes. Man, I not only would I love to talk to you more in the future when future arcs come out, but even to just if there's, you know, big music industry things that I, that I might just want to, you know, a, you know a, a quote or a quick, you know, little short phoner with you in the future, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, no sweat. Let me know. Awesome. Jeff Rugby over there in Salem, Massachusetts, writer, music producer, the man behind Gunning for Hits, out now on Image. Huge thanks for coming to Media Monarchy. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.